have eight o'clock on my little clock here. So welcome to another morning's talk here. And I hope many of you weren't scared last night as you were walking back. You didn't hear any bumping sounds behind you. <laughs> From the coffin ghost. <laughs> I know when I first heard that story, I thought it was very, very funny. You know, I remember sort of talking it to many people, including children as well. And children really love that, to know that religion, you can laugh and have some fun and have some joy. But the story today I'm going to tell, not a story, but I really thought I should say this yesterday but never got around to it, is like how to do other types of meditation, such as walking meditation. And uh, sometimes some people feel that walking meditation is a, like a second class meditation. But you notice we have three halls here the one over there, the one behind, and the one over here. And we built that, you know, I designed this place, and we built those halls there so that people can sit meditation here, and when your legs get sore, you can just walk over there and do some walking meditation, and you can come back here and sit some more. And you can carry on that calming of their mind sort of most of the, the afternoon or the evening, or whatever. You don't have to go so far to change the posture. Changing the posture is sometimes useful because it's very hard to just sit in one place for hours and hours, unless one is in deep samadhi, or even to walk for so long. And the walking can get you into deep meditation. It does not get you into the jhanas. I always thought that because in the jhanas, your five senses disappear. But one of my friends over in Thailand say he did know a monk who had lots of band-aids and, and bruises all over his face because that's what happened to him. He would get into deep meditation while doing walking meditation and he'd forget to stop. You know, you don't know your, what's going on. Your five senses have disappeared. They kept banging into the walls. <laughs> but that's the only time I've seen that. But anyway, over here we have these walking meditation halls. We have these little carpets for you to walk on. And they are yoga mats. And I deliberately, I tried my very best to get them a red color. Because this is red carpet walking meditation for you. <laughs> it makes it a bit more important. It's not like a second class meditation. And <laughs> because we put those... Uh, those carpets in there, it means that they, you know, psychologically, they train you just to walk along the carpet. Because otherwise, if the whole uh, room was like, uh, had a carpet on it, there'd be some people would start from one corner, walk right to the other corner, thereby taking up the whole room. And that's not what it's there for. Because that's a reasonably nice length. And especially if you start to learn how to walk mindfully. And that's how we do the walking meditation. You stand at one end and you put your head like down. You look about one body length in front of you on the floor. You don't look to the left. You don't look to the right. It's not like a competition who can walk fastest. But actually, they usually don't try and walk fastest. They try to walk slowest. As if the slower you walk means the more mindful you are. And that's again more go, my young. <laughs> we know what people are like. You've got a couple of people walking next to each other and sometimes they think, I'm going to walk slower than you. <laughs> You've done that too, Abby. Yeah, I have. <laughs> so this is not a competition. You try and be in your own little space. So you just put your gaze, you know, a body length in front of you, and that's so you're not going to step on anything or trip over. You can see the wall before you bump into it. And not looking at much, it's just the, uh, the yoga mat. It's not that interesting. And then, you know, you should put your hands in front of you. You can put your hands behind you if that's more comfortable, wherever they are comfortable. And you can put your hands on your head if you prefer it, I don't mind as long as your hands are comfortable, so you can forget about them. 
and then you just start walking. And as you start walking, I don't know, if you were standing at the wall, which foot would you move first? The left foot or the right foot? You find out. Not everybody's the same. So me too, on the right foot I start. So I lift it up. As you lift up your feet, it's nice actually to do without any socks on if you possibly can. The place is pretty safe. But when you have no socks on, you can actually feel more. Your, your skin is more sensitive. But at least don't wear shoes anyway when you're doing a walking meditation in this hall. Wear, you know, thin socks or something, but no socks at all is the best. Then as you start walking, notice what part of your foot uh, lifts up from the ground first. What lifts up next? What's the last part of the foot which breaks contact with the floor? And you don't do this on purpose, I'm going to lift this part up, then that part up. You've been walking all your life, so it's just a natural walk. But you do it slow so you can pick up more information. And once your foot is separated from the ground, then what does it do? Does it go straight up? because I've been doing this for years, that uh, my foot actually moves backwards a little bit as it lifts up. It doesn't lift up straight up, it doesn't go forward, it goes back a bit. And then when it's high enough, then it moves forward in, a, in an arc. And then once it's reached the end of that arc, then it goes down onto the ground. And what's the first part of your foot which meets the ground? What's the next part? What's the last part? These are little questions to ask yourself because it makes you more aware of what's going on in just one step. And then after the foot meets the ground, you can actually feel the weight of your body transfer from the foot which was uh, not moving at first onto the foot which is just stepped forward. So you can release the other foot, the left foot, now to do a step. And you're aware of all these incredible sensations in just walking one step. I know many people who have survived accidents or strokes and have had to learn how to walk again. And I learned how to walk when I was a baby. I wasn't really much aware of what you have to do to walk. But those people who have learned to walk again after some accident or sickness they say it's such a complicated process. There's so many muscles have to move. It's like some of you may like learn how to do dancing or something as a hobby or a sport or because you just love it. And all the muscles you have to know and be aware of just actually to move your body this way or that way. After a while it becomes like natural, so natural you don't even have to pay attention to it. But now we ask you to pay attention to all the muscles which have to move just to have one step, put it forward, and then go down. And quite honestly, that it is so many muscles have to move, there's so many sensations in the lower part of your body, especially you know, from the knees down, and other parts of the body as well, just for having one step. It becomes fascinating how much goes on just to have one step. And so that's what you're doing in the walking meditation hall. You're just observing, not looking with your eyes. Eyes are a body length in front of you, just making sure if anything comes across you or anything dangerous is on that uh, yoga mat, then you will notice it and you won't hurt yourself. In all parts of meditation, safety is important. It means you can relax. And so then you start feeling just you know what's going on with just one step. You don't control it, you just observe it, and it becomes fascinating. And then after a while you find there's so much going on there and it focuses your attention in the present moment and you don't do much thinking, there's nothing much to think about. You don't even have names for some of these feelings of a left foot moving or a right foot moving. But then you can observe it all, be with it, mindful of it. And it occupies the mind because it's very calming. It's slow, peaceful in this moment. 
not painful. And you soon get quite focused, naturally. And I always tell the same story because it's one of the best stories I had about walking meditation. This was in the middle of Bangkok, in Watsaket, the Golden Mount Temple. So there's lots of traffic all around, and even inside, there was cars would go through the temple, walk, uh, temple roads. And so every morning, because I was just newly ordained as a novice monk, then I had all this free time. So after doing morning chanting, and only about 10 or 15 minutes sitting meditation, that's what you had to do, and then all the monks vanished. And so I had the main hall to myself. And its length was probably about the same length as this um, uh, hall here. And I don't know why, but this was the meditation hall, chanting hall, ordination hall in one of these big monasteries. And they had, just to make sure it was really peaceful and quiet, they had a grandfather clock there. And every quarter hour, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, to tell the time. I don't know why they had these noisy clocks there. Why didn't you just have, you know, just an ordinary clock which was silent? But they had a grandfather clock. But I didn't mind that because it could actually, I knew how long I was taking. And it was half an hour from walking from one end to another end, maybe 15 meters or something. And that's actually really slow. But the only reason I was walking slowly because there was too much going on to actually to be quick. Just all the movements of my body, especially the feet and the, and the, uh, the legs. And I would only do like, from one end to the other in half an hour, and then back again. That was my hour's walking meditation. Didn't get very far. But the one thing I liked about walking meditation is in walking meditation, you end up where you started. You don't get anywhere. You start here, you go over there, and you come back again. You get nowhere. You end up where you began. I kind of like that perception. And it's not so much <laughs> you know, getting somewhere. The purpose of the walking meditation is learning how to be here, more aware and more peaceful. And as you get more peaceful, you do get the sense of the mind becoming still. And so this particular occasion was when I was about three quarters of the way through the walking meditation. And I'd already got to the end of the hall and I was coming back and you know, you're aware of your feet moving, you feel them lifting. It was amazing, all those muscles which had to coordinate, work together, just for your foot, you know, for the heel to move up, and then to start the foot moving up. And I was fascinated by it. And then I heard this sound, like, you know, 100 meters away. so. That's a full name, not just Ajahn Brahm. I wasn't an Ajahn then, I was a little novice. Brahma Wang So. Just like here, it's so quiet. If there's a sound on the other side of the retreat center, you can probably hear it. And when they're calling your name, Bali, Bali. You think that's really fascinating? Who's calling me from such a long distance away? So that took my attention away from the feelings in the feet. It was fascinating. Who's calling me and how can I hear it for such a long distance away? So that I paid attention to it. For 45 minutes, my attention was just confined to my lower legs and the soles of my feet. And now I listened to this sound and I focused on it and I realized it was coming from another monk who was shouting in my ear hole this far away. <laughs> and that was fascinating. How come when I was focusing on my feet for 45 minutes and my lower legs and really getting into it, even sounds appeared so distant. And that can happen to you when you're getting into some nice meditation sitting here. You're really getting still and peaceful and you hear the gong go. And it's not the usual sound of the gong. It's like the gong is being rang on, in Bodhinyana Monastery and you're hearing it here in Jhana Grove. That's how it feels distant. And so as soon as I realized 
there was a monk shouting in my ear this far away, and I remembered I was supposed to go to a ceremony, like a house diner. That's where the people give you food and you do a blessing for them. And I was so into my meditation I'd forgotten. Eating wasn't important. Not as important as you know, the peace and the joy, but I realized I was so genial I had to pay attention and do you know, what I, was, and my, I said I would do. So I had to turn to him, you know, to actually start talking to him. And it was fascinating how many muscles in your neck have to move to actually to turn around. I never realized how complex a process that was. You know, to turn your, your uh, head from looking a meter down or a meter and a half down to looking to the side. It took me about five minutes. Maybe that's an exaggeration, maybe four and a half. <laughs> And I'm really fortunate it was a monk sent to come and get me because the monks knew about what meditation is like and how even with the best respect in the world, you can't move fast. And eventually I got eye contact with this monk and I said, what? (laughs) (laughs) I was actually building up, going up the gears of my brain And he said, you've got to come to a a diner. And I said, oh, yes. (laughs) And now you can kind of understand that story I said about the person who was similar to me at that time, really getting very peaceful in walking meditation, who went back to his job in the zoo and got (laughs) given to look after the the tortoise (laughs) enclosure. (laughs) And he opened the door and whoosh. The tortoises go very slowly, but when you're in such a slow mind state, tortoises are much faster than you are. <laughs> <laughs> but I was fascinated just how peaceful it all was, and how slow, and how the five senses just were disappearing, just the feeling of the feet, which was basically all that was left, and just you no know, sound was distant. But that proved to me just how calm and peaceful you can become in a walking meditation when you do it properly and you give it importance. And then afterwards, once you've done some of that walking meditation, then you come back down and sit down on your seat and you're almost, you know, you're already in sort of a deep sense of stillness and it's easy to, you know, the breath is just there and you can get very, very peaceful with it. It takes you much deeper when you're sitting because your five senses can completely disappear. When you're walking, you have to still keep a little bit of some of those senses just to be safe. And that means you can get some wonderful meditation. It's like you're meditating not for an hour or 45 minutes, you're meditating all afternoon. Walking, sitting, walking, sitting, walking, sitting. And there's one Thai monk I met and he wasn't well known at the time, but you know, the monk I was staying with was saying, you know, he was a confirmed enlightened one, you know, full arahat. And of course that made you really interested. Let's go and see him. And his story was fascinating. He was just a villager and a farmer. He went into town, into the town of Sokonakon in uh, Thailand. And it just so happened, that was the, the day they were doing the funeral service for Ajahn Mun. And all these senior monks were there, you know, paying respects to their teacher. And he didn't tell me which one, but one of the monks said, if you want to practice meditation, sit a lot, walk a lot. And that's the only teaching which he remembered. Sit a lot, walk a lot. And, you know, he was fit enough and inspired enough. He'd done like farming all his life, so he decided to ordain as a bhikkhu. So he took ordination in one of the villages, and that's all he did. That's his only teaching, sit a lot and walk a lot. And apparently that's what he did. He'd have his walking path, and he'd walk very slowly, get very peaceful. When he was tired, he would sit down on a walking path. And then he would get up from the walking path when his sitting meditation was, was done and he would carry on walking. He'd do that for most of the day, just sitting and walking. 
No wonder, you know, he got incredibly nice samadhi. So good. His story was <laughs> that uh, one of the other Australian monks who went to visit him, that was Ajanyana, and he said, now where do you guys come from? I said, come from Australia. Where is that? You know, these Thai monks they only have four years of education at school. And, you know, that four years of education, they didn't know too much geography. You know, down south, where's that? Is that, you know, towards Bangkok, down south? No, it's much further than Bangkok. You know, it's really south. How south? Oh, you just keep going south over the Indonesia and over the oceans. Oceans? And then you get to Australia. What happens if you keep going? Oh, if you keep going, once you go past Australia, you go past Gachan Mudu's monastery in Albany. <laughs> <laughs> it was there then. And then eventually you go to the, the Antarctic. What's that? It's just like snow and ice, snow and ice everywhere. Really? Because in Thailand, the ice, you can sell ice. It's a very rare commodity. It's so hot over there. I mean, there's ice all over the place. You don't have to buy it. No, <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> and so he thought, that's really fascinating. And the following morning, when we uh, got together to go on arms round, and he said, oh, you know, you're right. You Western monks, you're right. What do you mean we're right? He said, I went there last night. Where? Antarctica. <laughs> one, of, one of these monks who could leave his body and just go. He said, yes, yeah, lots of ice down there, very cold, lots of, very white. <laughs> and he was such a simple monk, there's no way he was bragging or anything. He was just sharing just you know, the surprise, a very simple but very powerful monk, of what it's like when you go south, you know, leave your mind, your mind-made body, and go and see what's down there. And he became, we have his photo up in the dining hall in uh, Bodhinyana Monastery. A very nice old monk, very simple. Hardly anybody knew of his existence. But anyhow, that is actually kind of, <laughs> kind of what happened. Now, when I get into this, I say, sitting and walking, sitting and walking. So never underestimate this, the walking posture. That's a beautiful posture to do. And I know I'm supposed to say this because it's my character that sometimes people say, oh, when you, some of you have said, when you're in Australia, why do we always have to chant in Pali? And it's much easier because those Pali chants have been made a long time ago. To make an English chant, there's so many arguments. Should you have this word or that word or the other word? So, for ease, or you might say, not ease, but laziness, <laughs> we chant in Pali, but walking meditation. Can we make that more Australian? <laughs> Any of you uh, bhikkhunis volunteer? <laughs> you were laughing. <laughs> Come on, Venomudu, to do what we call kangaroo walking meditation. <laughs> now, keep your iPhones down, because <laughs> when I did this in Penang, so first of all, your posture, your posture like being like a kangaroo, and then you don't lead with your left foot or your right foot. That's not what kangaroos do. What do kangaroos do? Jump. Jump, that's right. Okay, that's right, but mindfully. <laughs> okay, enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, it's not just a joke. There's a serious part of that. And the serious part of that is when you're meditating all day, and just about this type of time of the retreat, some people get like dry. They get you know, kind of frustrated, nothing's working, what to do. So if you're in a walking meditation path, and no, it's like dry, there's no oomph in the meditation, it's not really peaceful. Just, you know, just from one end to the other, just one. Do a kangaroo hop walking meditation. 
that will make you feel just a boost of energy and everybody else in that room who sees you, <laughs> they'll get a boost of energy as well. It's kindness as well as your own happiness. And it works, you can try it out, because sometimes it gets very dry meditation, or oh, walk backwards and forwards, do this, I'm going to watch my breath, and oh dear. You make it sort of interesting, and it gets much more powerful. It's only just one, you know, just uh, one length of the, uh, the path, no more than that. And then you find this is how you learn how to put energy and fun and joy into the meditation, whatever you're doing. You know, sometimes we feel that you always go and sit in the same position. How about sometimes when you're meditating, turn the other way around? You say, what am I doing that for? Try and see what happens. You will find that just because you're change your posture, just to turn around the other way, it actually makes it more interesting. You're more alive, you're not a creature of habit. You're not boring. You're just doing it. You can still use your cushions or whatever else you've got there, but it does actually make it more fascinating for you. You know, it's sometimes you say you shouldn't do, but it does. And that's also why we have the teddy bears, or the, I don't know what other animals you've got there. What's that pink thing? It's a teddy bear. What, what species is that? Is that an owl or what? Oh, goodness days. <laughs> and I like the big black teddy bear over there. That's huge. <laughs> but you can actually change these little animals around and just couple it while you're meditating. It's just, what it does is something interesting. And that interesting means it takes that little bit extra mindfulness, it boosts the mindfulness, and it's soft, it's not threatening, and you get into deeper meditation that way. When you're meditating day after day after day, it's nice to have these little extra tips on how that meditation can go deeper. But the reason we're doing all of this, to get it deeper, is I know many people talk about you know, mindfulness, I talk about kindfulness, and I hope by now you're noticing that mindfulness, kindfulness, whatever you wish to call it. You have ordinary mindfulness and you have power mindfulness and superpower mindfulness and all stages in between. Even a drunken person on a Saturday night in Australia is mindful enough to somehow or other manage to find their way home. You know, going from lamppost to lamppost but they get home somehow. They got a tiny bit of mindfulness, but enough to be able to get home. That's not the sort of mindfulness we're talking about here in meditation. The mindfulness gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And I mentioned that superpower of mindfulness when the floor is just, wow, it's amazing. And the colors are rich. And the fragrances you can smell outside. They're fantastic. And the food, how's the food here? You know, the food is actually ordinary. But because you've been meditating and you're eating in silence, it gets more and more and more delicious. You wait until the last Saturday or Friday or whatever, and then it'll be delicious. I don't care who the cooks are. I learned this when my very first meditation retreat, still as a student at Cambridge, and the only way we could have a meditation retreat was hire three boarding houses, you know, student boarding houses, you know, during the vacation time. Which was nice, a nice, you know, your own little room there to sleep in at night time, a, a big hall there to uh, listen to talks and to meditate. But the thing which I dreaded at that time, this was in 1970, I think, the part of this retreat which I really dreaded was the food. Now at that time, UK was not famous for its cooking. <laughs> Most of the food were boiled potatoes, 
boiled vegetables, boiled so much until all the taste and juice was extracted, and that's what you'd have to eat. Honest. And the worst of the bunch, of all the cooks and chefs <coughs> in the whole country, were reserved for poor students in boarding houses. It was disgusting food. And I really thought, maybe I can take some sandwiches. And I knew that city by now, I was studying, and I knew where all the, the, uh, the shops were, all the cafes were. I could sneak out and get something, instead of just this boil this and boil that. <laughs> but I was surprised, honestly. The food was delicious. And I thought, I must have some good karma. Of all the boarding house cooks in the whole of that country, I'd managed, because of good karma, to get the good one. And that wasn't the case. That cook was just the same as a poor old cook like every other boarding house. But because my mind was peaceful, Whatever flavor, whatever remnant of taste was left after all that boiling, I could be aware of. <laughs> That's why it tasted good. <laughs> it was weird, but that was true. Your mindfulness is increasing. And whatever bird chirps in the morning, you can hear it so much clearer, and it's so more beautiful. And then that particular retreat, you know, we were doing a lot of sitting meditation, as well as you know, the resting and listening to uh, uh, instructions. But we were allowed to have a walk every morning before breakfast for one hour, a bit of exercise. And I knew, you know, that area. I still remember the name of the road, Bateman Street in Cambridge. And I knew that also because at the end of that road, there was the Cambridge University Botanical Gardens. What a great place for a walk, early in the morning. That's what I did. I walked to the Botanical Gardens, and then I went, as soon as I got through, it was one of the back gates, not the main gate. <coughs> as soon as I got into the, one of the small gates, the first day, I was captivated by this incredibly beautiful clump of bamboo. And I've never seen such a beautiful uh, plant of bamboo. And I kind of realized why in like Chinese watercolors they always have bamboo, lots of it there. Just the way that it bends you know, in this very smooth, almost sensuous arc under its own weight. And even the colours, they're not bright and glary. You know, the greens and yellows are just so soft. And even the leaves are so slender. The whole thing was very refined. And when I saw that clump of bamboo, so perfectly formed, just swaying gently in the morning wind just after dawn, I was captivated. And I just stood there gazing at it like somebody who was crazy. And I had enough presence of mind, not mindfulness, but realized where I was and what I was doing. If I'd have stayed like that, just staring at it for an hour, somebody would have called the men in the white coats and they would have taken me away. No one does that. I know that in UK, people are very, very conservative, especially in that time. They think I was taking drugs or something. <laughs> so, I do remember there was a park bench close by, so I sat down on a park bench and continued stirring. I never finished with that clump of bamboo. After 50 minutes, it was just delighting me. And I realized I had to go to breakfast. And in that age, breakfast was really important, even more important than it is now. <laughs> so I got up and went to breakfast, and I went back the next day and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. For eight days of the nine days we were on retreat, I went to see that most beautiful clump of bamboo. I never finished with it. But then the retreat was over, 
And then what happened next was you, know, you went back to college and your social life and busyness. And uh, so one, about a week or two weeks later, I had a free afternoon. I thought, I'm going to go and check out the most beautiful clump of bamboo in the world. So I got on my bicycle. That's how we you know, got around in Cambridge. Got on my bicycle and you know, got down to Bateman Street, went down to the end of it, you know, parked my bike, and then went into the gate. And all in anticipation of seeing the most beautiful clump of bamboo in the world. And as soon as I got into that gate, there was this desiccated, dry, sickly looking, weak plant. Bamboo should not grow in a country like UK. It's far too cold there. But what took my attention was, where is that beautiful clump of bamboo gone? It was there two weeks ago. And now there's this ordinary, ugly, thing which you know, shouldn't be outside in the cold air. Should be in some maybe greenhouse somewhere, but not outside. It looks so sickly and so weak. Where's my beautiful clump of bamboo gone? And of course you realize it was the same clump of bamboo. And now my mindfulness was depleted with all that busyness and work. And I could not see the beauty anymore. Just like I needed that peacefulness, that strong mindfulness, to be able to enjoy the food. And this is where you started noticing just, you know, what mindfulness really is and how it gets incredibly strong with your meditation and you soon can see the beauty in almost anything. And imagine how much fun that gives you. Whatever you're looking at, you see just gorgeous things all over the place. And they're just bricks, you know, ordinary bricks, you know, the, the, the shop, the factory. And they look incredible. The same old bricks, but once the mindfulness is strong, it's like they open up to you and you can see so much more depth in them. And that um, poet I was talking about, William Blake, his name was. He also did lots of artist work, which I really liked when I was a, a young man. But his poem, To see a world in a grain of sand, heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand. That's what he was talking about, strong mindfulness. I don't know where he got that strong mindfulness from, but that kind of explains it. A small thing. You know, sometimes he's sitting up here, you see a little ant or a beetle just going across the floor. And you look at them and they're incredibly beautiful. You're not scared of them, you just admire just the way they're put together. And everything becomes so fascinating and enjoyable. You're beginning to see you know, eyes with you know, some really sort of um, penetration in them and sound which is so gorgeous, and smells and tastes, and even physical touches like your breath going in. It just doesn't go in fast. It goes in so incredibly gorgeous, delightful. So many different feelings of pity sukha as it breathes in. You really appreciate it. It's something which is delightful as gorgeous as the sunset, as beautiful as you know, the <coughs> seeing the waves come in the beach. Have you ever done that? Sit on a beach alone and see on a very calm day, see the water you know, come in, the small little waves come in and they come up the beach and they stop and they go back down again under their own weight. I see many people sitting there watching that for hours. And that's exactly what you do with your breath. See this air you know, coming into your body. And then the wave just kind of breaks. And then it falls away again, goes out again. It's like the ordinary breath, but this time gorgeous and beautiful. Soft, uncontrollable, natural so peaceful and you don't have to think about anything you don't say what am i supposed to do next 
That's why I try not to give too many instructions on what stage one, stage two, stage three is. Instead, you stay where you are, and it's beautiful. And it gets so gorgeous that it's the joy, the peace, the beauty is what really takes over afterwards. You're just having a wonderful time. What you're observing, I don't know, just the joy is so strong. And that's when, of course, you see these things like nimittas. What is happening to be able to see this, even a delightful breath? It means your awareness is getting stronger and what the Buddha called your hindrances are getting weaker. Those hindrances, they call them niwarana, it's like desire for the world of the five senses. Basically wanting and you know, the ill will. It's amazing how many times people have ill will and don't realize it. Now you see, watching the breath go in, and it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I know, but I've been there before. I want to get nimitus. You have ill will. It stops you getting deeper. If you want to be somewhere else, that's called ill will. Okay, just looking at the clock, this story. This is a story of the monk who was teaching in prisons. Not me, because I was too busy going to Singapore and other places. <laughs> and uh, the prisoners liked him, so they asked him to stay on a bit longer after his class, and after he stayed on a bit longer, they started to ask him. You know, they were serious, they were kind. Well, what's it like being a monk in Australia? At least, you know, you've seen us, you've seen the monastery, you've got some idea what it feels like being a monk. So, you know, what is it like? Because they're in prison, they can't come visit. So he, he said, well, you know, you know, they ask, what time does your day begin? What time do you get up? And as soon as he said four o'clock in the morning, the prisoners were just so amazed. What crimes did you do to have to get up so early? <laughs> in, prisoners, in prison, even murderers don't have to get up till six. You must have done something very bad to get up at four. Every morning. <laughs> and that's when he said it's optional. <laughs> you know, the punchline of this. It's optional. You don't have to get up at four. You can always get up earlier if you want to. <laughs> but then you ask him, what do you do? You get up at four. You know what happens. You do some meditation or you, you do some work or, or maybe walking meditation. And he said, well, can't you just go and watch the early morning news on the TV or catch the, you know, the late night movie? He said, no, we do not have TVs in, in, in um, monastery. <laughs> they do in prisons. <laughs> so then, what do, you do? what do you have for breakfast? I must admit, in those days, it was true. All I'd have was a cup like this with, I think, two or three Weetabix in and some milk, and a cup of tea, and that was it. And that's all they give you in a, in a monastery. Oh, we can have bacon and sausage, we can have dumplings or noodles if you're from Asia. We can have so much stuff, whatever you want. Pancakes, waffles. It's not in a monastery. And they were really disappointed. This was their friend. A terrible in your monastery. But then what do you do after breakfast? What do we do after breakfast, Venerable? Work, yeah. What type of work do you do? Is it heavy work? Can be, <laughs> depends. Real <laughs> Mudito, even over in Melbourne, do you have to work hard? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we work really hard. Once he described how we work, the prisoner said, oh, they never get us to do that. We go on strike, even in prison. I thought of doing that once, having a sit-down strike. <laughs> but then I'd just think we were meditating all day <laughs> instead of protesting. So anyhow, so what do you have for lunch? You've seen what we have for lunch. Now, in Bodhinyana Monastery, we eat out of our bowl. 
Do you eat out of your bowl here, Venerable Nuns? Everything go in the same bowl? Yucky, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is true that sometimes, sometimes you let other people put the food in the bowl for you. You know, the whole lot. And, you know, I've already told you, I've had some amazing combinations. <laughs> I think the <laughs> strawberry ice cream on spaghetti bolognese. Because <laughs> it's, it's a bowl, sometimes it goes in the wrong place. And they said apparently even in solitary confinement in prison, you know, the, uh, you have compartments, you know, in your tray. Not like a mug is in a bowl, it goes all over the place. You know, one of the worst things, I was complaining about this, especially now, is so many monks and novices at Bodhinyana Monastery. So I know I take my food up first, because I'm the first in that line. And people say, oh, you can choose whatever you want. Yeah, but there's a downside in that. And the downside is if I have some ice cream, and I you know, put it in a bowl, I take it up. By the time the last novice has come up, <laughs> My ice cream is melted. <laughs> That's happened so many times. It's a waste of time taking ice cream. Just take some milk. That's good enough. It's the same thing. <laughs> so anyway, it went on like that. I, mean, I should say about the, uh, the sports, because in prison they take, play a lot of sports, you know, like football and tennis and goodness knows what else. They say as monks, you know, can you play games in the afternoon, sports? I thought of that. You know, it might be a lovely way to actually to engage with the members of other religions here. <laughs> I don't know if you heard, it was kept pretty secret uh, a couple of decades ago the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Anglican Church, and the Pope, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, decided to you know, try and unite. But you know, which particular part of Christianity should they follow? So being good Christians, they decided, let God decide. We'll play a round of golf. And if the Archbishop of Canterbury wins, the Pope will have to become an Anglican. If the Pope wins, the Archbishop will have to become a Catholic. Let God decide. So they played this round of golf. The stakes were so high. <laughs> and the Pope was a couple of shots up. The Archbishop already sunk his last putt on the 18th hole, and the Archbishop, if he, no, the, the Pope, if he sank this putt, putt, he'd win by two strokes. It was a long putt, but the Pope was in really good form. So, you know, he, <laughs> you know the putts line, don't you? <laughs> he don't. Okay, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> Just by the way, it's, uh, it's <laughs> Nicholas's birthday today. For those of you who want to know. Because, yeah. <laughs> so back to the Pope. <laughs> and so the Pope asked his caddy, and the caddy, please excuse me, this is not Buddhist to play golf. And the caddy was a Catholic nun, of course. Asked the caddy, you no know, for a putter, and he lined up the putt, and he realized the future of Christianity was resting on this putt and he hit the putt. It went past the hole. It went on the rim and went to the other side. He missed. And the Pope, because of the excitement, he couldn't help himself. He said, damn it, missed. <laughs> and at that, the nun, she crossed herself and said, no, your, well, how do you address a Pope? Is your Excellency or your High? Eminence. eminence, okay, or Eminence or something. Your Eminence, you shouldn't swear like that. I know the stakes are very high, but that will offend God. That's against our rules. Don't say, damn it, missed. And so he said, I'm sorry, sister, I won't do it again. 
But then he had another putt to actually to sink if he was going to still win. And this time he never putted it hard enough. It didn't get close to the hole. And as soon as it you know, didn't get close to the hole, the Pope said again, damn it, missed. <laughs> and the, the nun crossed herself again, now your eminence, please don't offend you know, uh, God. Saying that it was really not the right thing to say. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was just so excited. I won't say it again. He never said it again. Because the next time he putted, he missed the hole completely. And then there was this big roar from the heavens. And a big thunderclap came down. And that thunderclap hit the nun and killed her straight off. And this roar came from the heavens. Damn it! Missed, <laughs> said God. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't resist a bad joke like that. Anyway, what was that before? Sorry? Prison. Oh, yeah, prison. <laughs> That's where I deserve to be. <laughs> oh, yeah, playing sports. Not golf. <laughs> but honestly, can Buddhist monks play sports? No. It's good for your health, isn't it? But if we did play sports, it would have to be played according to Buddhist principles. <laughs> so being English, I once thought, why don't we start a Buddhist soccer team? Buddhist principles. So first of all, if the other team try to tackle you, of course you'll let go, come on, take the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Scoring a goal? You wouldn't like to score a goal against the opposite side, that's not compassionate. That upsets them, adds to their suffering, you never do that. Maybe an own goal you can score, but not your own goal. And you'd enjoy losing, be the biggest loser. <laughs> That'd be the Buddhist principles. And I reckon that is why. Have you ever seen a Thai soccer team go to the World Cup? <laughs> Never. Singapore soccer team? <laughs> Sri Lankan soccer team? Even when they won the World Cup cricket, it's most because of the, the, the Tamils and the Hindus in the team. Is that true? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> so it's a waste of time playing sport as a monk, so we just meditate in the evenings. And anyway, then they last of all, they ask, well, what time do you go to bed? And the monk said, bed? We don't have beds in monastery, we have them here. But in monastery I sleep on the floor. Many of you have been into my cave. Have I got a bed in the cave? Just a mattress. I much prefer sleeping in mattresses because sometimes in beds the first couple of nights you're afraid you might roll off. It's quite a long way down you know, from the edge of the bed onto the floor. <laughs> it's pretty scary. <laughs> when you're on the mountain floor, just keep on rolling, you don't get hurt. <laughs> and they said, oh, even just in solitary confinement, you have a bed to sleep on. Anyway, at the end of that story, <laughs> the prisoners were legitimately surprised how austere Bodhinyana Monastery is. And they were so upset that their friend they got to love and like was doing it so tough, one of those prisoners blurted out, that's terrible in your monastery. Why don't you come in here and stay with us instead? <laughs> he, he was invited into prison <laughs> for a holiday. <laughs> 
I mean, that, that's a, a point to that. But then afterwards, that's when you start to say, why is it that there is a waiting list of people trying to get into Bodhinyana Monastery? Isn't that the case, Giacomo? It's a waiting list. And there's a waiting list of people trying to get out of jail, even though it's far more comfortable. Why? How hard was it to get on this retreat? You don't have anything in the evening to, to eat. You've got no TV, you can't catch up on the news. You have to sort of sit for hours on uncomfortable <laughs> mats, <laughs> listen to the same old jokes again and again and again. <laughs> And you pay for this. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> but why, why is it so hard to get in here? <laughs> There's something else happens in here, that just the beautiful wisdom, the kindness, and the respect, which you don't get in jails. But most importantly, a prison, a jail, is any place you don't want to be. I love saying that. If you're fed up with this talk, then it's like being in jail here. If you're in a relationship, your partner, and you just, it's not working out properly, like being married is like being in prison. If you're in a job, oh, crack, you have to go to work again this morning. If you think of your job like that, then a job is like a prison. If you're a body which is sick, painful, dying, your body feels like a prison. How do you escape from the many prisons of life? You don't need to climb over the walls. You don't need to change your job or change your partner. Look, I've done a lot of marriage counselling in the past. This is for all you women who are just having a really bad time with your husband. If you change him and get another one, it's exactly the same. <laughs> They've got different packaging on the outside, <laughs> but the motor inside is the same model. <laughs> it's a waste of time. The same with the other gender as well. So instead of trying to change the partner, just be happy to be there. See all the beautiful parts in them. Same with your job. Be happy to be there. You've got a job. Well done. You're sick. Be happy with your body. The body's trying to heal itself. And that's what sickness is. Just the aches and pains of the body try extra hard to make itself healthy again. So that's how you escape from the many prisons of life. Don't actually change anything except your attitude. Being happy to be here. Meditation. How do you get deep meditation? Changing your posture, changing your medita meditation object, changing your attitude, changing your teacher. They're all pretty much the same. Instead, change one's attitude. Be happy to be here. If you're happy to be here, that contentment, that peace, builds and builds and builds, and creates this beautiful, powerful mind. Very strong mindfulness, strong joy, and then these beautiful things, they happen. You don't make them happen. You're just happy to be here, that's all. Be content and easily satisfied. Not proud or demanding in nature. Where did you hear that before? In the morning chanting. Words of the Buddha. Thank you all for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Ha 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 
Okay, so please have some nice walking meditation this morning. In the, over in there or in there or in the back there. Or, you know, just even in your, your cottages, as long as you don't bump into other people. And just have a nice time sitting and walking, walking and sitting. And see if your mind can get so beautiful that whatever you see in the sky, the birds in the air, or the little rocks you know, in the gardens, they're just so gorgeous. Then you know that meditation is starting to work. Thank you.